Next up is the cross punch and we need to remember that you don't necessarily need to be training these things one after another. You can be training your basic punches at the same time once you kind of learn the, um, the fundamentals of each punch, which is what we're doing in the, these early videos. You can train them as, as, a, uh, as a holistic curriculum. You know, you can train your, your jab and you can train your cross. Obviously, we need to learn the, the mechanics of it, of it first. But remember that one of our, our key conceptual ideas is that we want to get twice the results for, for half the effort. So we start understanding that it's in the nature of the, the nature of the structural system of each one to do that. Like the, the, the learning method itself, the curriculum itself is also designed to accelerate learning as you go along. And one of the ways that it that it does that is having a very high range of transferable skills. So from our from from practicing our uh, jab and we've learned certain things about the, the like the wave like movement certain beginning to learn certain elementary things about structure and learning about the lock point then we're going to bring those transferable skills straight over into the cross it's going to be very much the same movement lots of same lots of the same principles and all the same concepts transfer over and that's something very interesting about structural movement the way that it's designed to have all these um transferable skills and transferable concepts that, that that gel no matter what it is that you're doing. So let's imagine that someone does Western boxing and they're quite good at that, but then they decide they want to learn Taekwondo. And they find straight away there's lots of transferable skills that pass over. They're strong, they're fit, they're used to sparring, and there's lots of conceptual, um, conceptual attributes that also cross over. So the idea of attack and counter-attack, defense, footwork, and so on, but other than that, you find, you're going to find straight away that in terms of the actual technical movement, that there's massive differences. And there's also things that are detriments, things that don't, things that don't add up with one, that, that, that then won't add up with the other. So you, you want to be further away for Taekwondo and you want to have a different kind of guard for boxing and so on. And certain things are drilled in, like you start, you start throwing punches to the face when that's not allowed and this kind of thing. Each one, isn't like that. The structural movement paradigm is designed to not be like that. If, if, if you were in that position, there are people like that who are like that, who, you know, have gone into MMA and they started out in Taekwondo and they've learned boxing. And what they have to do then is find the middle ground themselves. They have to alter both of those skill sets to find that middle ground and they have to kind of conceptually reinvent that skill set. And some people have done that very successfully, but, but in structural movement, the idea is that that's already done for you, that, that there isn't a, a division like that. So when you come to do kicks, for example, in, in, in each one, everything's the same. The, the, the movement is the same. The way of releasing energy is the same. The, um, the guard is the same. The structure is the same. The structural movement principles are the same. The footwork's the same. Everything's the same. Everything knits together into, into one holistic curriculum. And that happens because it's the, the thing behind the movement that's important rather than the, the technique themselves. Understanding the techniques and the ins and outs of the techniques and how they work is very important. That's what we're doing in these videos. But it's the core, the core movement skills that are, that are beneath it that knit everything together. That does lots of useful things for us. It accelerates the process of learning for one. So that once you start learning a basic skill in, in, in one thing, it applies to everything else. So it massively amplifies your ability to learn and the speed at which you can learn. It also makes it much easier to learn those things. What one of the, one of the ideas that, that we talk about is, is the multiplier effect. So that, that if you learn if if you learn two things, they're both based on the same structural movement. And so you can then extrapolate from that lots of different other things. And so a good example would be we're going to learn how to do a cross. So we do. So then we'll know jab from the first videos, and then we'll know cross. And then we know all that footwork and we can start putting all those things together. Already we can create thousands of different variations of combinations, all based on the same, exactly the same structural principles, exactly the same footwork. You know, so we might go, we, we did this where we went to the side and did a jab. So we might do jab, cross. And there's an infinite number virtually, I, I, I should think it is infinite, just from that tiny amount of, you know, just from knowing the jab, the cross and those those footwork exercises that we did and the structural movement principles that we've, did, we've been discussing. There's just an infinite number of possible combinations and variations. I mean, you can always do like three punch combinations for so there's literally infinite. 
And this is in the nature of the structural movement concept. We call it the multiplier effect. So that once you start learning different things and putting them together, that you yourself can unfold. And that, that, that then expands into this other really important conceptual idea that, that we use here at the base that, that we call um, the infinite curriculum. That there's something about each one that's very different, that, that, that you can explore this infinite curriculum by putting, once you've got the principles and a few movements, you can start putting these together and it just, it constantly expands. So the infinite curriculum is just like, you know, a lifetime, a lifetime of exploration and just putting things together. So this is a very important way in which you can teach yourself and that you can coach yourself by critically engaging and being very engaged. That in itself is like a, um, it's like another version of the idea of intent connecting up with the body. It's like your intent connecting up with the, the, the curriculum itself, your intent being engaged with the curriculum, being an engaged learner and putting all these things. The, the, the barrier to that really is, is just that people don't want to do it, that they think they've been, there's so many people telling you that, that the only way to learn is to learn from, you know, whatever your teacher tells you and that's it. And that's not what Wang Sheng Jai thought. And, um, one of Wang Sheng Jai's students, Han Si Huang, who's a really important, like, like he's the most important student of Wang Sheng Jai that you've never heard of. Um, he's not one of the Han brothers. And he talks about um, when, when, when you reach the, the, the stage where you are, where you can say you've learned boxing, you are, a, you know, you know what shoe, that's the point where you know, it's a lifetime of thinking about problems and solving problems and really engaging directly with pro how working out and taking control of yourself of your own training and thinking about designing your own curriculum. So, so in short, what I'm saying is like once you've got just a few techniques, you yourself can start thinking about, well, what, what if I do, what if I do jab forward and then jab to the side like that? And you can just start designing your own, your own little training drills and working on them. If you think like that, then you will improve exponentially. You'll improve exponentially. The, the only limits are like your own talent and your own will. So just an even will can compensate a lot for not having enough talent. So that's two, two really important ideas that the multiplier effect, combining things together to create new things and the infinite curriculum, recognizing that there's all this stuff, even from a limited amount of movements that you yourself can then start putting together. So you don't need someone to download that into you. You yourself can start exploring that and designing um, your own drills. And it's, it's one of the things I have I have students do, by the way, I, I, I'll say at a certain point, right, just just work on drills and they'll say, what drills? And I'll say, well, you need to, you need to think about what drills. I might, I might give them something like um, drill, drills that involve two steps and they've got to think of the drills. And very often, like people will stop after it and go, well, I can't think of any more. It's surprising how hard that is to do, like even with an infinite curriculum. So you've really got to engage that, that idea. Where all that ties in with, with the cross is that there's lots and lots of transferable skills. It's a very similar movement. Um, so we start in our usual way. Um, one foot back, half a foot back, a foot's width out and then turn 45 degrees and then the, the, remember we call the pelvic area the quad we we'll put our fingers here and do that we don't do that we don't do that every time this is just when um when you're starting out learning it's very useful and i know that students find it very useful because the fact people have all kinds of they, they don't know how to stand and they'll do all kinds of things with their with their stance so it's just a really useful exercise until it's drilled in and when it's drilled in you just you just assume it naturally and um, don't forget you know if you've got longer legs and bigger feet and you know, you need a different kind of weight distribution or you've got one leg that's damaged or something, you can always adapt it. Each one's adaptive. It's not fixed orthodoxy. It's about you and unfolding your skill. So it's got to be in harmony with your your physical being. And we've got we've got our basic, we've got our basic posture. And the idea is very similar, very similar to the to the jab that we want this wave movement. And we don't need to go through all of the same principles about you know, the fist and the movement, it's exactly the same as the jab. So it's going to wave this way. It's going to be like a wave movement first. And we use this pivot routing. Pivot routing turns up like that. And we wave forward like that. I'll talk about the routing more in a moment. Whoop. 
that oh. that disrupted my flow then. That was quite you could see where it actually caused me to to what? to uh, to stutter my flow. That's quite interesting. Yeah, that's quite an interesting learning moment. I was doing that then and the dog barked and it just startled me a little bit and it just stopped it just stopped my flow. Um and that, that's quite interesting in this thing about like can you affect people without touching them? And there's all this thing about magic powers and I remember remember saying to my coach there's a couple of that asking about this like kind of empty floor stuff. Can you make someone move without touching them? And he went like that, like he was gonna slap me and I went like that. And went, so, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, you can make someone move without touching them. But look like um the the power, the power that it has to like just be very aggressive and shout at someone and move forward to at them to startle them and stop them in them in, in their flow like that. That's exactly what the dog did to me then. Um he's laying he's laying on his back barking at passers by, which is quite, you know. His life is so easy. So we have this flow, we do it this way. And again, it's like these two circles. So again, like, I just like this old way, this old way. You, you'll see it like that. The, a lot of the old times doing this movement. Um, and I've already discussed why it evolved into this. You know, it's an evolving process. So we've got this. And the next really important thing that we that we need to learn is that the way that the, the root functions is that the knee is usually pointing towards the, the hip point, and the hip point is usually the center line of the of the opponent. So we imagine a line going right through the opponent opponent. It doesn't have to be, of course. Like this. It's just I don't know what it is. Some people just need need to believe in orthodox structure so much like they need to believe in an orthodoxy so much that they won't vary from it but you know it might be that the right thing to do isn't to hit the center line it might be that they're bleeding on you know this this happens all the time for example i know it's, you know, it's gross um but if someone's cut like for example in boxing and then they target they target that cut deliberately so you're not hitting the center line you're hitting you're going deliberately for one side of the face so you need to be adaptable um someone's got an injury um, and it's hard like like it's okay saying attack the center line but what if you're going to attack a leg the legs usually aren't look you know where's my center line there's nothing there so if you're going to attack the center line if you want to attack my leg you can't attack the center line so this like unthinking adherence to orthodox theory is just you know it's, it's the opposite of what we need in terms of, of practical each hand training that's going to Hopefully, I mean this is the vision. This is the this is the dream. What we try to do here is rebuild, rebuild the structural movement revolution to a point where it's going to actually be successful in the global martial arts world, in self defense and in sports. I'm not making a, a you know this street versus sport thing. We want it. We want it successful in everything. So thinking about our theory really intelligently. So, but normally we think about. We think about attacking the centre line and that, that's very important in terms of how we structure our footwork we can maybe look at later. And the routine usually points towards the knee and the foot will be pointing towards the centre line. And that's just based on very simple laws of physics that when we hit and the, the, the energy goes back and we want to root it into the floor, if it's, if it's turned off slightly that will buckle that way, if it's turned out slightly it will buckle out that way. So it's just not as strong, so we lose the solidity. Remember, that's one of the key ideas that, that we want in each one, that we're gonna hit, well, we call it hitting with the floor. So you hit someone with the floor, you feel that that immense solidity when they, you know, when, when, when the punch hits and we feel the energy go all the way through. And you can feel that, by the way, I said before, you can feel it like when you're holding a pad, you can feel it when someone does that, and you can see it on the back when someone does that. It's not some kind of magical thing, it's just a, it's a very straightforward law of physics. But you won't have this straight away, so it looks dead simple. Um, but video yourself doing it and just check. You've just got to learn this again. It's very much the Xin Yi Chuan idea of, of the harmony of the hand and the fist. It's a, it's a more sophisticated understanding of that concept. These have got to be in harmony and they've got to be in line this way. So you don't over pivot like that. And it's one of the reasons why, for example, you can't do this very fast um, uh, pinball paddle. You know, when you play pinball and they go like that, you sometimes see people doing like that, particularly in the each one, where they go like that. And they get this, and it's, it's, it's a short, sharp movement, but there's not enough power generated from the, you don't give enough time for the, well, what, what these days we call the kinetic chain. 
um, there's not enough time for that power to link to the floor. It's just, you know, and it's and it's a bit of a funny movement as well. And I always think like it's so easy just to twist your ankle doing that. It's wrong anyway. So you need it. You don't want to go like that out too far. The only time it goes out like that is if the target changes like that that you fall that you follow through with it because it keeps this point. And then, and then even then there's a limit. You don't want to go too far. So that's quite an important thing to practice and you need to check it yourself and it's very good if you've got a full length mirror you can check. You can just check your posture and just check that it's just check that it's in line. Because once you get this rule it's going to really revolutionise the way that the way that you punch and it's one thing that um, you can usually really easily connect uh, correct rather that, that people aren't connecting with this correct movement. So you can see people like like doing this and then it's like, well why? Why, why are they not getting the solidity and the punching? And you can see all the way through that this is this is buckling this way, and this what this is doing is it's absorbing force. It's absorbing it's absorbing the force that should be going back into the. But when you change it in line like that, and you can push back from the floor, part of the energy is going to come not just from being rooted but pushing forwards. Look at how it works. I'm pushing into the pushing into the punch. And then when you change it and you get it in line, all of a sudden the solidity of the punch improves. So it's a really simple thing, but it's but it's much harder to do in practice than it is, you know, like um, if you're really used to doing it. Just remember, everyone was a beginner once. I couldn't do it once, you know. I had to have it corrected and then I had to really work on it. So, but eventually it will become intuitive. I should say then, like, like the rules a little bit different when you when you do a jab. So if you if you use pivot rooting with a jab. You can see that the, the, the knee is at the front knee because with the cross it's the back foot that's doing the pivot routing with the, the, the jab it's the front foot that's doing the pivot routing and you can see that the knee is going off like if the target is there the knee is, the knee is pointing like this exact rule doesn't apply in the same way but it could so remember when I talked about like um, there's different ways of thinking about Wushu, but in the old Wushu text, like they would say, it's like it's just opening and closing, up and down. So we can naturally do a jab like that. It's the same. This is a structural movement in exactly the same way. It's far lee in exactly the same way as it is to do it, to do it that way. And you could do it that way so that the the knee is in is pointing towards the target. But but it's not a stronger structure anyway. So it's got a buckle risk this way when you. Hit, it's really easy to push you over whereas this is much stronger technique and also maybe something we didn't I can't remember I don't think we talked about it in the in the jab this brings your face a lot closer to the a lot closer to the target so you need to be much more close range whereas this is much longer range so it's just that much more useful but this isn't wrong and you can use it and it might be the right call and there's lots of techniques that we use where we do need to we do need to do it like that but the point being in, in this case is like this rule applies, it applies for backhand techniques a lot more than it does for a lot more than it does for front hand techniques. With front hand techniques it's just the the knee goes towards the target but it will point past it. So don't try and keep the knee pointing towards the centre line of your opponent for a jab, it doesn't work in the same way. These are all things you just develop intuitively. You feel it in your own structure. And just when you hit in the bag, like these are not this is what's different with each one, right? It's not like somebody says do it like that and you just do it and there's no reason for it. This is like, if no one told you to do that, you would just start doing it naturally. If you are a diligent and engaged learner and you're just on the bag and you're just hitting the bag and you're just trying different, different ways of doing it, you would naturally come eventually to this conclusion that you do it like that and this way you do it like that. It's within the nature of the thing itself that you will feel the, the difference in power when you do it right, power and stability. So first of all we're doing it as a wave and then remember we talked about this idea of the lock point so then we bring it into the, the lock point in exactly the same way just as, just as remember when we did the jab we lift and we turn exactly with the cross we lift we lift from here, shoulders lift. And look what I'm doing, I'm pushing this, pushing this shoulder forward. It's just a mechanical movement. If I had no muscles at all and I was just a skeleton, you could see the, 
you know, you could have like a stick man. You could make a little stick man puppet and it just go like that and lock into the lock into the strike like that. So you lift, lift and turn at the same time. Lift and turn and push in. And that means very similarly for the for the jab that when you when you do it you're actually moving back a little bit like that. And you're making this solid, this solid structure. And we can think about the jab and the cross like in, in, in relationship to boxing, and that's that's quite a useful way of thinking about it. So think about if if you're boxing and you start like 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 you're maximizing the rules so you can cover up with your massive gloves and you're not gonna be kicked in the you're not gonna be kicked in the legs or anything like that. So you can you can maximize the rules to your advantage, which is exactly what you should do in a sporting competition. Um, if you're gonna do it, you might as well win. And and you punch like this. You know, and the rules themselves kind of determine that you want to cover up a lot like this. And you punch like this, and that's just coming from the arm. So as a diligent and engaged boxing practitioner, uh, you think, well, how do I have power? How do I have power into that? So then you start thinking, well, you know, I'm gonna put my shoulder into it more like that. And that's gonna add power. And then you start thinking like, well, I can lean into it a bit. Like that. Then you're adding whole body weight, whole body weight power like that. And that's one way of moving, that's one way of generating force. It's using, it's still mass time speed, but it's a different way of using mass time speed. Mass time speed, and it's still using structure. And we can use that as well. We can put our body weight behind movements because we want to do that because it, it increases this equation, mass time speed. And you can start speeding it up, and that also starts getting, starts getting power into it then we can look at the difference then, then with a with a with a jab first that this whole structural movement then starts instead of like getting the body weight in it like that we generate power in a different way that we short short movement around the around the axis and you can do things like like um it's just in the nature of the, the the short sharp movement that you can do this 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 chasing. We we'll call it chasing fist, where you, you you jab but you don't pull back. You, you, know, you can just chase it, and you can generate force twice like that. We we'll talk about that another time. That, that and I've talked about also that uses what we call quarter routine, where you go up like that and you go like that. Boom, boom. And so there's no there's no question that you know doing it doing it the boxing way is is provenly effective. Like in, well, if anything, it's far more provenly effective than the each one way of doing it. So what, what we've got really is an analytic argument that says, well, in certain circumstances, might it be right to do it to do it in a different way? So there's a bit of a different rationale behind behind the each one movement. So let's now think about the let's think about the same thing with a cross. So we've got a boxing cross, and they've got it's like it's very similar, very similar thing, but then the same thing, adding in the the pivot route in. It's a bit of a backwards way of thinking about it. it, it come, there are movements in traditional Wushu like this, but it comes into each one particularly from Western boxing. So it's not like it's not like co-evolution or something like that. It was deliberately brought into particularly Yao's each one from watching Western boxing. So you do this. So we add in the we add in the pivot routine like this. And again, very similar to that, like a lot of people do in early generations of Yao's each one where they do that pinball paddle twisting out quite fast like that because you want it you want it quite fast and then we change that change that into a structural movement um, you can see straight away that the body inflates into a bigger into a bigger thing like we're becoming this big this big insect and the the idea is that this like it's not just about sport, it's applicable into sport. And in sport we can change and we can utilize all of these kinds of things, but we're also thinking about primarily about like the worst case scenario. And it's not this thing about it's not this thing about street versus sport or something like that. It's applicable to both. But the rationale, the thinking is, well, if if you are in a really serious fight, what's the best what's the best conceptual way of approaching that? And the idea is the idea is that um, every part of the body 
kind of becomes dangerous with this kind of movement. So if you look at this kind of movement with, with a cross, there's no force whatsoever being, there's no force whatsoever being issued from this arm, right? It's completely static. There's really no force being issued from the hip. There's no force being issued from the shoulder. It's just, this is the offensive. This is the offensive weapon. And part of the rationale in each one, part of the idea was that like, through structural movement, you can make the whole body into like an offensive, into an offensive weapon. So look at the, the difference. So this is hitting back. I mean, I'm doing it, I'm doing it quite slow. You can see me doing it fast on a million videos that I've put out and doing it on the bag and sparring. All of a sudden, right? And, and similarly, like, if you do it like this, there's no force issued from the outside of the forearm. Just this, just this is the offensive part. That's got a hit. If that doesn't hit, then nothing hits. There's nothing else, there's nothing else generating force whatsoever. Maybe you could just ping someone with your, with your heel. That's the only. That's the only thing. Um, whereas when we start doing it like this, so straight away, one, this is issuing force back with the elbow, it's issuing force up this way. And this is what we call an active guard. And the idea is, you don't have to use it all the time, but the idea is like, particularly with, with no gloves on, or you can think now with just MMA gloves on, right? You, you haven't got those big massive gloves and your opponent, you know, in boxing, you've got them on, your opponent's got them on, you can do this kind of covering up um, and it's really safe and it works really effectively. People start finding straight away in MMA that you can't, you can only bring a part of that in. So you will see, obviously, of course, people using this kind of, you know, covering up all the time like that. But people try to use, try to use head movement and um, body movement, distancing and footwork, very much like the the principle that was thought about in old each one that the Wang Shen Jai was thinking about. It doesn't make each one, like MMA doesn't justify each one. It doesn't confirm each one. Each one's got to exist practically. You've got to be able to do it practically. If, if that's not possible, then it's just theory. But the theory is right. The theory is right. And we could see that straight away in MMA with um, people realizing like, that well, those little gloves aren't going to give you enough defense. And if you do that, punches can come right through. So you've got to be more mobile. You've got to use distance more. What, what we don't see at the moment is like this kind of use of an active guard. And again, I, I, I mean, I genuinely and passionately believe like the issue isn't like, can each one beat MMA? That was never the idea. Can each one beat boxing? Well, the idea was, is there something here from Chinese physical culture that can help everyone else that other people can go, oh yeah, that could really work in what I'm doing. And, um, that That's the dream that, some, that, that eventually, these principles and ideas that Wang Shenzhai developed will become globally standard that people will think like, yeah, that could really work, that could really help. So this becomes active. I'm hitting, I'm hitting with this part of my arm and, re and look now I'm not hitting straight, not like a boxer hitting straight like that. I'm hitting curved like this. Um, again, this is the unity of square and circle that Wang Shenzhai talks about. And that they kind of developed in independently, but then he says like, then he went, he was reading other stuff. He was reading other manuals from the past. And then he began to realize like, ah, this is what the ancients were talking about. Or so, such ancients as there are that who's, um, in many cases, the manuals are quite modern, but they say like they were taught by, you know, they copied from ancient manuscripts or whatever. Or um, he talks particularly about Zhang Feng and, and, and hating him. And because he hated like what Tai Chi had become. And then he, he, he finds some, works that are attributed to Zhang Zhang Feng and he says like straight away realized that Zhang Zhang Feng really did really was a true sage and really did understand the true principles it's just that they become corrupted and then this is what I'm talking about in terms of each one being kind of gamified that when when he reached that level of insight where he start thinking like yeah you don't want to be too straight like that because it's like it's too brittle when you hit you want to be curt and you don't want to be too curved because it's too it's too floppy like um so he talks about, for example, like round round force being full on one side and empty on the other. So when you swing in like that, and you swing in with a big hook like that, that that it's full on this side, but there's no energy on that side. So it doesn't matter if if this side if something hits into this side, all the energy is going that way. So he starts developing this idea 
the unity of square and circle. Or, you know, he's aware of the idea from... from um, it's, it's not like a key idea in Shingi Chuan, so he, he kind of develops it from other... from learning about other martial arts, training with people and reading about it. So the kind of... the, the, the cross, just like the jab, is curved... is curved like this. Now look, right? If this hits something, you can go right past the back and hit, and I practice like this all the time. Missed, missed the cross, hit with this bit, hit with the elbow. Yeah? And I also practice missing the bag on the outside and hitting him with the hitting him with the shoulder. But this, this, you miss with the cross and you hit on this side with with curved, what Wang Shang Jai calls curved force. This is completely empty. This is full, this is empty. In other words, there's no force on this side. But if I hit this way and hit the bag, now all of a sudden there is force on this side. So with unity of square and circle, you can have force on, mul on more than one side. Um, with, with square force, it's just that. And if I miss either side, there's nothing. Um, the best, may maybe I could hit with my shoulder, but it's not in the right position because I haven't got this. Remember the idea of the apple being, being under your arm. If I miss, if I miss on either side, I can I can maybe hit him with the shoulder if it's close, or if I hit with anywhere along here up to the up to the elbow, I can hit with. So it's full on this side as well as being on this side, and it's full here. And even if even if it comes in on this side, I might be able to just clip it a little bit, just straighten my arm a little bit, and I'm just hitting a little bit like that with the clothesline. So it becomes like. But you can see the conceptualization of it is genius. That the, there's more things that you can hit with it. it increases the surface. You know, Wang Chun Jai talks a lot about planes and contact with planes. It increases the amount of planes that you can hit, points that you can hit with. And exactly the same. Like, just look again. Like the hip. Um, we do. You know, you do it really forcefully. You know, maybe, maybe someone goes in for the takedown and you can just hit hit with the hip. And um, Yao Zongzong particularly talks about this idea of hitting with the hip. And I just thought, like, why, why would you ever do that? You know, like, I didn't understand. And then then I only understood when I was watching a video with someone, uh, like American college wrestlers, when someone goes for the takedown, they don't always sprawl. Sometimes they just deliberately try and check it with the, with the hip and just hit into the... You know, someone comes in and you hit into the shoulder and side of the face with the hip. And thought, oh, that's a very similar idea, isn't it? Like so, so you might go for the, you might go for the, the cross. They go for the, they go for the takedown, and you slam in with the. I mean, you have to hit with, you're gonna have to hit with some force, but you might just be lucky. There's some force there, or it might be that they throw a kick. Um, you know, classic each one kick is to kick this part of the body. By the way. Um, yeah, this video of me doing it multiple times far and we just kick that part, it just kicks the leg out. But someone can kick down, you can hit him with that, and you can hit back and release force that way. It's even some force coming from the coming from the the leg, and most importantly, it's going out like that, so it's, it's giving a bit of force out, which helps to solidify if someone throws a kick that way. We're still need, gonna need to do loads of leg toughening. I'm not saying it's gonna stop a massive Muay Thai leg kick, but a crappy kick. Someone who's a bit crappy and you're going to just release a bit of force it's going to push out a little bit a bit of energy pushing out into that kick so i've got all these all these points now that are kind of releasing force and we've got this this arm it's hitting out it's hitting back it's hitting up and we've also got the shoulder so the shoulder's hitting back this way and that's just that's just one of the things. That's just one of the really useful things about structural movements. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. This is why I think like Wang Ching Chai's genius is going to revolutionise the whole world eventually. That was the dream, you know, that, that, that was kind of ended by the Second World War. But that's the dream, and I, and I really believe that people are going to start thinking, well, no, actually, that makes a lot of sense. That kind of movement is very different. It's very different to that. That can be really powerful, but. This is a whole different, a whole different concept that, that applies itself very well to kind of like uh, mixed martial arts or things where there's much, there's much less rules, um, things are much more chaotic. Um, the other thing is, it's like it's also very powerful. It's like look at the structural movement and see what we're seeing here. See the genius here of what we're seeing is this is the kind of movement you see in forms. This is the kind of thing that you see that you see in Shaolin Chuan. You know that the, the um, you know this this kind of 
this kind of movement. The, the kind of forms movement, um, this kind of, you know, Wu Bu Chuan, if you don't know it, lovely little form. It's that kind of concept, structural movement. But like Wang Cheng Chai's argument is like, oh, over the centuries and indeed millennia, structural movement has, has been lost. Like, like only a handful of people have retained the memory of what it was supposed to be. And it kind of gets de degenerated into forms. And then various people kind of revive it because it's, it's a natural thing. Um, but, but broadly speaking, it's lost. And he's putting together all the different elements of the jigsaw to put it all back together. So what we're seeing, this is why Wang Shen Jai says, like, when you, when you see this kind of structural movement, actually, this is Shaolin Chuan. This, is, this comes from Bodhidharma. This comes from Dharma. This is, and, and, and also, you know, like infused with older stuff from... Um, the even more ancient past of China, particularly standing and things like that to help improve this, this process. So Wang Shenjai says, this is Shaolin Chuan. This, th this idea that it's just like boxing, like, like that each one is just like Tai Chi and Western boxing, it's like, no, no. It's a completely different paradigm. That, that's not helped, I think, by people who really don't understand structural movement and then they try and compare it with what they do with Western boxing. It doesn't really work and you can't really see like, What's the difference? This you can see. This you can see the difference. And you know it's right. You know it's right. Everything about it is right. Everything about it looks right. Everything about it is conceptually right. Everything about it makes sense. Everything about it is in harmony with science. Everything about it is in harmony with Chinese physical culture. This has got legs. This is something that can globally become a massive thing if we support the structural movement revolution. So it's a, it's a strong, a really strong movement and we just do it like this. And this, this is the next important concept. So as I'm teaching you these basic concepts, I'm also teaching you some really advanced stuff that, that we need to get. So this kind of movement, there's a couple of things we need here. One is the, one is the, the point where you stop like this, hit and stop, what, what, what Yao Zongzong calls hit and stop. That's a really important concept. So this is the lock point, remember, before we were doing it like this. So when you're doing your training, first of all, practice like this, up to the hit and stop point, and just in exactly the same way, hit and stop, hit and stop, relax down, like up to the lock point, like that. But when we do hit and stop, we hold that posture a little bit more like that. And that's usually when we're gonna add in something else. We're gonna hit and stop, and then we're gonna change into another punch when we start bringing it up into combination. So from the lock point concept, we're gonna to have to learn hit and stop. So holding it a little bit longer, and then what we don't do is pull back and then do another posture with one, two, like that. Look, I'm combining, I'm using the infinite curriculum, I'm using the multiplier effect to access the infinite curriculum. One, from the cross and then change back into the jab. Look, one, two, I'm combining them together and I'm using the genius of structural movement. One, look, I'm here, I'm here. So I make, I, I, I make the most of this. All I've got to do is turn back this way. One, two, one, two, one, two. And look, I'm using this hit and stop. One, I don't pull back. I just pull straight into the, I pull straight into. Remember, if I'm going to punch with this hand, the movement begins on this. I pull back, and the movement, the, the punch on this side is going to begin with this hand. I pull back, structural movement. I'm using the structure to my advantage in a really intelligent, in a really intelligent scientific way that at the same time couldn't be any more Chinese, it couldn't be any more ancients. It's the structural movement paradigm of the ancients. It's what Wang Shenjai calls the Wushu of the ancients. Unfortunately, we've got people who are so lost, who are so lost on the path that they think like, no, you must do it like this. You must do it like this, like a Beng Chuan, because this is more Chinese. And I think this this is the thing that we, you know, this, like, um, when Wang Shenjai was developing each one, and, and there's this element of nationalism that comes into it, that people try to find something that's uniquely Chinese. So, so they become fixated on the technique that it must be done like this. And in, and in, and in Qing Yi Chuan, you have your hand down like, 
you know, you're gonna punch like that. So we must do it like, we must do it like that, you know. We must copy this. And then you start rationalizing, well, I'm gonna take down the arm and punch that way. And you start rationalizing the technique. You start becoming deviated towards making it more Chinese. And what Wang Shang Jai did was he thought about it completely differently. He says, well, it's not the techniques at all, is it? You know, techniques are, there's techniques that are useful, but it's not the techniques. It's the core body movement that matters. It's this structural movement. It doesn't matter if you do it like that. And you can think about, well, I'm going to take down the hand and do it like that, you know? But it's not the techniques. It's not the techniques that matters. It's the core body movement. That's the thing that comes through from the ancient world. That's the thing that's truly Chinese. And then that's just genius, isn't it? Because it's Chinese. It's in harmony with the laws of physics. So it's modern. It's modern and scientific. It's from the ancient world and it's from the modern world. That couldn't be any more Chinese in itself. The, the dialectic meeting of opposites. And at the same time, the techniques themselves, they belong to the whole world. So they come from the whole world. So you meet someone who's saying, you know, instead of doing it like that, do it like that. And then there's scientific reasons why you want to do it like that. So that's come from broadly speaking, Western boxing to do it like that. Obviously that exists in, in Mushu, but the idea of doing it like this, just changing it a little bit more into that Western boxing paradigm. Hansi Huang is asked about this because he, because, because he, you know, obviously he knew Yao Zong Zun and he knew, he knew the Han brothers and Han brothers were more Xin Yi Chuan and, and, and Yao Zong Zun was more Western boxing. And he's asked about, well, well which, which is best, you know, which would Wang Chun Jai approve of? And, and, well, pro in reality, probably the Han Brothers is, is the reality. He wasn't that keen on the, the kind of direction that Yao Zong Zun was taking it at that time. Um, but, but Hansi Huang is very, very forward thinking. And he says like, look, right, the only thing that really matters is science, which is the most, which is the most scientific. And he um, says so like, the thing with Yao Zong Zun is he was very wealthy when he was a young man came from a very wealthy family. So he was exposed to a lot more Western culture. He was exposed to more cultural variety than maybe some of Wang Shen Jai's other students. So he had more exposure to different ways of doing things. And um, this is Hansi Huang's argument, you know, like, I mean, he knew these people. They say like, so he was just like, he just a bit more open-minded about things. But he says like, but the bottom line is like, they both work. They both, he says, there's not, there's really no difference. There's no difference between Yao Zichuan and Han Zichuan. That, like, like for him, who was also a student of Wang Shengjai, he just saw Wang Shengjai's art, but with flavor that had been brought in from some different, some different influences with different people, which is inevitable. And he says, oh, that's inevitable. And the only thing that really matters is, can you justify, can you justify scientifically that maybe it should be this way? And he says, thinking about it like that, Yao Zong Zun's way is probably more scientifically justifiable. You can get, you know, you can get that extra screwing force on, and all those other reasons that we talked about why you would turn your your hand for the most part like that. So I don't want I don't want people to worry too much about the idea of um, hit and stop first. We could talk about it another time. There's really good conceptual reasons for it that particularly. In, in, in the chaos of a fight, you don't want to waste any time. The more time you're in the fight, the more time you can it can go very wrong for you. So you don't want any dead time. So you don't want to be like one, two. This is dead time when we one, two, three. There's no dead time. As this pulls back, this is pulling in. There's no dead time at all. And you start training like that. This this is called the principle of continuous attack in each one. And again, it's massively misunderstood by people who just they, they don't understand the conceptualization they've just not well i'm hope i'm hoping that you know we can really upgrade everyone's thinking about this because at the end of the day this is right this is the right way of thinking about it and it's obviously right scientifically obviously correct the uh, and anyway yeah, i was on one talks about it specifically so we know it's right continuous attack doesn't mean just keep reeling in on someone it's, it's a principle, it's a principle of the way that you attack, that you have no dead time, so you one, two, three, nothing's wasted, no, one, two, three, four. You, this guy was shimmying and using the, the body in this way, so that there's no dead time. When one arm's pulling back, the other arm's hitting out, and the only time that stops really is like when you've got to use your defense more, and then, then you launch your attack again, and you use this principle of continuous attack, and then you back out, then hopefully the fight's over. But don't over worry about that at first. At first, just think about bringing it up to the lock point, lock point. And then when you start combining, then start thinking about hit and stop. So one, two, one, two. And this is quite a big movement. So if you're gonna go one jab, cross like that, these are big structural movements. 
Look, the body's going all the way over there and it's going all the way over there. This is also a wave that you add force by the way, one, so you see the way I'm swaying one, two, and going over to the side like that. That adds a bit of slingshot power into the, into the movement. Remember, we talked about adding as much power as possible, using the rules of the structural paradigm to add as much power as possible. When you come to do that, then you need to think about hit and stop. So you don't want to go in one, two, like that. You want to go in one, two, and really thinking about it like that. One, two. And don't drop the arms like this. One, two. This very effective movement that unfortunately some people do in each one that, well, it's not scientifically sensible, is it? Doesn't, doesn't fit in with any of the paradigm. It doesn't make sense in the context of the fight. One, don't drop. The shoulders drop and scoop in. Not the hands like that. You can generate a little bit of extra power because obviously there's more distance on the run up. You're getting more of a run up. But the power's going to come from the shoulders. So the shoulders drop, the body drops into the hit and stop movement. One, two, one, two. Hit and stop. That's what you need when you start doing your structural movement combinations. The next thing we're going to need, and the next thing that's really very different, very different with Western boxing is what, what Zhao Daozin calls teleportation movement. He wrote, wrote an article about this, the kind of punching skill that, well, he doesn't even, he doesn't even link it directly to each one. He just links it as a, a quintessence principle of Chinese wushu, the teleportation punch. And the, the idea is like, um, the, the feel is like your fist is here, and then it's there. It's in one place and then it's then it's another. It's economy of movement, but it's also the speed, short, sharp movement. So when we say Farley is a short, sharp movement, well the body's quite big. So if if, if I if I do Farley with the whole body for a kick, well my, my foot's quite far out, so that's not a short movement, is it? But this is the short movement around my axis. So that's the short movement when I turn out and I push it in my head and we'll talk about it when we, when we look at kicks. So it's the same with a punch. Like, actually, this is quite a long movement. Cross is quite a long movement. It can be even longer. But it's the turning around my axis is the short, sharp movement. That's the far lead. And that's going to that's gonna throw out this kind of teleportation movement to the stop point. And you've seen it on Star Trek or something like that, where it goes into hyperdrive. It goes, and it just, it's here, and then it's there, like that. That's the kind of concept that we want. Just teleportation movement. So again, it's very much like you can see, you can see where this is linked to forms, where this is linked to towel. It's the kind of movement in forms where, you know, we horse dance and punch like that, with the hands here and the hands there. It's the same principle. The idea in each one is like, it's got corrupted, it's got lost. Like the, the true art has been corrupted into this more, like, like it's gone too far over into structure. The, the structural movement has forgotten the the um, the other side of the equation, the springy, the springy flowing movement. But it's when you move, then it's like teleportation. So I mean, no, no one does it all the time. But you can go and see the videos of me sparring where I just you know, <laughs> there's no pullback, there's no tell, there's nothing. Like, and that's something you've really got to work on. So there's no, there's no. There's quite a few. There's quite a few videos of of each one people training, where you know before they throw throw across, they'll just they'll move their other hand or they'll move they'll drop the hand and then do like that. That's quite common. All these little tells pulling it back, and, and similarly, um, when you throw across, like the cross goes, the cross goes, but the hand is still here, and then the hand, then you kind of artificially do that, and that. That's one of the things you see with, with, with beginners, like they just they, they can't coordinate this, this movement well. So for a teleportation kind of movement, you need to not pull back, not give any kind of tell whatsoever. So it's just gonna be here, and it's just gonna go straight from here to there. And that's gotta be authored by this short, short movement like that. Begins on this, like the way to think about it, like just with the jab, is you pull back with, pull back with this hand, you turn very fast on your axis, and that's that's the kind of teleportation movement that, you, that you're after. You should start trying to get that straight away because some people can do it much faster than others. And if you can do it, you can do it. But it's it's not something that you can just do, like particularly when we're going to hit a bag and stuff like that. 
there's so much involved in terms of the consistency of the configuration. And remember, that's the, you know, each joint's got a different level of tension and relaxation. It's got to find that right balance. Again, that's this thing about having apples under your arms and in your elbow pit and so, so on. It doesn't just position your arms, it helps you to kind of imagine and visualize the right kind of level of tension that you need in your body um, to transmit force and also to be able to, to move like this. That doesn't just come easy, it's got to be developed in a process that we call cultivation. And that's like, you can think about it like, the brain just needs this fine grain data, but it takes ages. It takes ages and ages for it to just develop this skill again. It's very, just working with fine grain data. So it's just like improving a tiny little bit every day. Um, of course, we know, we know how you develop that. Like it begins with standing. That's like, like Yao Zanzun says, everyone looks for a shortcut, but actually standing is the shortcut. This is the genius of Wang Shijai to recognize that actually it's the standing. It's the standing that, that really cultivates this. Standing really develops this ability to intuitively use the right, you know, to, to have the right kind of consistency of um, body coordination. And when we say intuitive, we don't mean instinctive. So here's another thing that people really get wrong in each one. We're not, we're not talking about something you're born with as such. We're not talking about, um, Okay, you can say you say you're born with some elements of it. That's fine, but it's not something that you try to access, like some kind of instinctive movement. That's a very big difference, for example, with the kind of Edo portal movement culture stuff, where he's kind of superficially like Wang Shenzhai, but he believes like there's this kind of caveman thing that that's been repressed by society, and that's not the the way Wang Shenzhai thinks thinks about it. It's not instinctive; it's intuitive. Now, intuitive means a learned skill in this case, like through practicing all these basic skills and your footwork, just like we do all those footwork exercises, and then eventually you get so proficient at it that you just do the right footwork. Just the same as learning any other sport. So that's not, you know, you learn to do that in football, you learn to, you know, you learn to play the piano like that. Those things aren't instinctive, but the intuitive ability to improvise and use, you know, at, at a certain point. This, this very important idea that at a certain point of quantity, it changes into a different quality. So at a certain point of quantity of practice, your intuitive ability takes on a whole different quality. So that's part of the process, part of the process of learning. But the key, the foundation thing is this ability to, to manage the right, all these different joints and parts of the body that the, that the intention can control. I mean, really it's controlling everything, even things you think it's not. You know, I think like, like when I do the when I do the vibration movement, which doesn't always you can't always see it on camera. Um, it's a really good example because I couldn't do it at first. I couldn't vibrate, and I had to, and 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 I didn't believe that it was possible. I'd heard about it. I'd heard that Yao Zhong Zhong could do it, and I heard that Wang Shen Jai could do it. I thought it just can't be possible because I'm stood there like that. I'm thinking there's 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 nothing. There's nothing that would make me vibrate. There's nothing in my body. Um, that's, I thought, well, yeah, but you do you shiver, don't you, when you're cold and stuff like that. So I started realizing there is, there is, and eventually you start you start developing the um, the vibration. You can't you can't really see it on camera, I know. So the skills we're developing, they're they're not instinctive. You don't know each one naturally as such. There are certain movements that are much more naturally in harmony with your physical structure because that's just the laws of physics. If I want to release force and clothesline that way, you know, these are kind of. They're natural in the sense that they're in harmony with the laws of physics. That's the way I'm going to maximize power doing that posture. There isn't another way to maximize power in the same way. That's all the calculations of the laws of physics lead to that posture. So it's natural. But the ability to do it isn't natural, you know. But the ability to do it in a moment and to have the right configuration, that's now intuitive. If I want to do it on the bag, I can just do it. If I want to do it on a person, I can just do it. That's intuitive, but it's not natural. Now, I think I've, I've mentioned elsewhere, this is a very important idea in Chinese Wushu, and it's, it, it's represented by this idea of fire underwater, that, that um, through the cultural process of Chinese physical culture, you access and develop this ability, and we call that cultivation. It begins with standing and then slow movement, and then we have very specific exercises that we want to use, um, particularly mental induction. So. From your standing after a certain point you can just start like, like in your mind just like imagine that you that the, let's say for a cross you just imagine that you you throw in a cross and you just kind of trigger in the 
And sometimes you might even see like a little little movement, and other times not. And you use the visualization. And even just lying in bed, you can visualize the movement like once your proprioception reaches a certain level, even just lying in bed, you can visualize movement and you can actually feel it in your mind. So you can kind of train in your mind for this posture, and that also affects your your actual physical movement. It's part of this whole concept of mental induction that's like a foundation training method in each one. But I want to talk about that separately. Um, so I don't want to go too far into that. But, but on a grosser level, you can practice like, for jabs and crosses, you can practice just from a kind of standing position and then just go in like, just short movements like that. Just practicing that. Um, that kind of movement. And you can even do it on the back, and you can do the actual punch, just stand and just think, it sounds dead easy, but it's so hard. And I know from like working with lots of people, it's so hard to just hit the bag. No, no pullback and nothing, like no tell, nothing, just hit the bag. Just go like that teleportation movement. Next is not going out on a walk. It's thinking about the, it's not we're just being out walk. Is thinking about thinking about the footwork that we that we use with the cross and well bless you but it's not even tea time so I don't know what you no let me get on with this it's thinking about the footwork that we that, that we use with the cross and it's some slightly different variations from the from the things that we do with the jab. So, so our first concept, we've, do, we've obviously done it on the spot. Um, the, ne the next is the diagonal. So this is probably the most important. Whereas with the jab, like the diagonal jab's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of an oddball. It's one that you wouldn't use that often. With, with the cross, it's like the, the bog standard. So stepping out diagonally that way, and then hitting it with the cross this way. So one, two, and you can just practice like this. Just, just moving on a diagonal and change. That's a great way just to begin, just begin practicing working on that. Just mo moving out on the diagonal. And you can see what's happening is that as you adding in the, the body weight of the the movement. That's one of the things. The other thing is like when you do it with force like this, because you're twisting over like this, you go into a very vulnerable very vulnerable position. So, um, yes, I did say position. You go into a very vulnerable position. So you want to step out a little bit, just stabilizes the, stabilizes the posture. And it also adds a little bit of force, this kind of slingshot body weight. Um, so even though we're using foul, even though the concept is probably like this kind of teleportation movement around the axis, even though we're doing that, we can still add in force through multiple other different different things, including like adding in our body weight with a step to our power into the, um, and that's what we're doing, we're seeking every little way of adding more force into the, into the punch. I should say, by the way, like, um, it's not always the right call. So this, these big structural movements, they can often be quite slow. And sometimes what you really need is speed. So you shouldn't be, you know, you've got to be adaptive. It's only like, I think it's people who never really do any proper fight training. They think like you've got to maintain religious adherence to orthodoxy. Like it might be that actually just doing more of a, more of just punching with your arm because it's faster. But if you can get them right on the nose, well that doesn't matter, you know, like the, the, the conceptual idea is like if you're in a real fight, in a real life or death fight, you want to hit as hard as you can, as soon as you can, um, to end it as soon as you can. As long as you're in the fight, it can, it can go against you so but it's not always the right thing to do it might be right to hit with speed rather than hold structural force um, and also it can slow down combinations when you start using this this kind of structural force uh, we'll talk about that i'm going to talk about that in, in a maybe in the next video how we how we develop more speed how we overcome that and that, that development stage where we put our intention in our shoulders and throw the throw the punches out from our shoulders but I don't want to I've already talked about or I don't want to talk about too many concepts in one video. I know it's like overwhelming and um, trying to download everything that I know so it's, it's quite overwhelming I know. So it might be right just to do a, a shorter faster 
movement. So don't don't be a slave to orthodoxy. Do what's right in the moment. And it can very often be right to kind of drill in, drill in with a few fast punches. And then the last one is the proper full power, you know, fight ending, fight ending punch. That being by the by, for the basic posture, step out on a diagonal and punching this one. You can just do it on the spot as well. Just step out like, step out like that way. And adds a bit of power and it also helps to stabilise. And that becomes very important, for example, when we when you do this very classic Yao Zichuan posture where you go one, two, three, like that, and you think that's a very odd, that's a very odd footwork. Why would you do it like that? Like that. Three, like that. But when you do it really, really fast, then you realise that little footwork shimmy is stabilising your structure. It's really rooting your structure a lot better. Um, and if, and if you don't do it, you kind of go over. So like, it, there's, there's a really good reason for it. So that's diagonally stepping out this way or just stepping out on the spot. But there's no reason why we can't do it just like a standard boxing pendulum punch. And that's where you just come straight in forward like that. And in that case, just like with the jab, you use the seeking step like that. And you just go straight forward and hit him with the, hit him with the cross like that. And again, remember, even though like this is our standard each one stance this isn't a talk about itself so this is a unit it's not a fixed measurement it's a unit you might want to go half or one again you might want to go longer um and you might even want to trail the foot like that into the cross that happens all the time to get the extra to get the extra um now I'm trying to do it on purpose, I can't do it, but there's plenty of examples of me doing inspiring where I trail the foot because I do I cover such an amount of distance um, to get to get the crossing. But this kind of pendulum cross, seeking step forward like that, just exactly the same as with the, the jab, and you just punch straight like that. Seeking step forward, straight. And that's a really useful. And, and you can be very mindful like that, just set it up, just wait up a big boom like that. Just go straight in, straight forward, proper Xin Yi Chuan principle, like a spear, just going cut through everything, drill through, don't care about what anything else is coming in, just drill through and hit through, absolutely dead straight. That can be a really useful, really useful technique. The next really common step we see is the, is the what they now, now call the triangular step, this kind of step that you practice in, in most of you like this, this that they became the foundation step of each one. There's a lot more different kinds of Mosabu, I have to say. Um, very interestingly, you see a lot more in Hans each one than you do in than you do in Yao's each one. So Han Xing Chao wrote a book where he detailed lots of different kinds of Mosabu, and this is just this is just one step. So we, we step in, we step in, and then out, and we hit. And again, we use this we use this slide of the step to add to add force into the force into the punch so using the body weight just and then just put the zing on the end of it with the with the far lead so you've got to time everything right so the body weight is going forward um, so you're just increasing the mass a little bit using the laws of physics increasing the mass a little bit and zing right into the solid structure and then root it into the earth and then just zing it right into that lock point where you hit and that's the Point where you strike the opponent. We do this very much with the hit and stop concept, so, so we we'll usually go like one, two, like that. And one, two, three, and we're kind of moving side to side to get the to get the movement. Then of course if you can do that, then you can do it do it backwards. So it's exactly the same thing. Step back, it's a little bit more. Like it challenges the brain a little bit. So some of these footwork, we get into intermediate footwork. It's astonishing how like you realise how poor your coordination is. Like at first, it's unbelievable. So we step back into the punch. Look how I step back. Now I step back into this, into this pivot routine. But it's not really. We call it kind of kickback routine, particularly when we do it. When we do it faster, we don't slide. We lift the foot up and then kick back into the. Push into the floor, push into the floor, and push forward. And remember that push adds force as well. It's not just stabilizing. We want to push forwards with it. So even though we're moving backwards, at the last minute we want to push forwards, push forwards with it. 
just pushes up into the shoulder and the shoulder pushes up out into the out into the punch and thing. We just use that same step going back on. Usually the faster you do it, the faster you do it, the more the foot lifts up more and the more you the more you kick back. The, the danger with that as I learned during lockdown when I was training outside is that on some surfaces the foot can slip when you do that. Um, but you know that's life. So nothing's, nothing's going to be perfect, and there's always going to be mistakes. What matters is can you adapt to that mistake? So, my slip, change, you know, adapt to the mistake, just like all life. Similarly, of course, to the pendulum step, you can just step straight back. So one, and then step, and as you step back, you twist up into the twist up into the posture. So one, you don't want to go too far here. One, because you're moving your fist very far away from the from the target it's not like like the jab it's still very close to the target but your cross is very far away from the target and if and if it's gonna you know if you step too far if you're gonna hit if this is where it's gonna hit look how close they are to your foot so you're gonna, just gonna take this foot out anyway aren't you? so don't step too far just a short step step and then as you as this slides back twist up into the punch like that or slides back, twist up, and think like you know, you're gonna hit him with your hip like that. Again, all this side of the body hits in, hit with the whole body, one like that. So the hit and stop, hit and stop point. So one slides back, twist up into the posture. It's quite it's quite difficult to balance it actually. So one, two. One, two, one, two. The other variation, of course, is to go from the go from the back leg first. A little shuffle, shuffle step back. In which case, it comes up straight away. Like you do it simultaneously, but this obviously the back leg is going first, and then it turns up onto the ball of the foot, the pivot root, here, and the front foot slides back. So this is quite a fast little. Fast little movement. Um, remember, practice everything eight times as part of your routine. Now you've got jabs to practice everything eight times, crosses to practice everything eight times. If you start doing combinations, well, it's just, you'll be 10 years doing that. Too much. Train smart, train smart, don't worry. Just practice eight times everything. Drill it all in. And exactly the same as with jabs, you want to go side to side. So, first one is step the front foot out. One, two. As you step, one. As you punch, this comes into this kickback routine, legs pointing towards the target, and you punch. And you want to use the momentum, like the momentum of the of the step, so add a little bit of extra mass into the into the equation. One like that. Change. Just like with the gel. If you can do it with a jab, you can do it across. If we go with the, if we move with the back foot first, which, which you may do because there's, there's a particular setting we do it, where we chop out with the side of the foot to sweep out someone's foot or go for it. It's not like to break the knee or anything. So you don't need a lot of force for this. When they step, you can just, like I do it all the time, just, just dink their leg out of the way as they step in. So when, when we do a cross with this, we don't go up on the, the pivot routing for the back, we go up on the front foot, it's a little bit, it's a little bit odder like that. See, I'm up on the, up on the ball of the foot like that. When you do it, you'll see why it's about balancing. It's about a compromise between the step and balancing and then the force, so like that. So it's fully flat rooted this way. Something on my shoe that doesn't look healthy. One. And it's this tippy toe routine here, like this. And this is this kind of um, classic or well, kind of thing you see in Jan shoot. Very traditional wash shoot posture. Usually you see with weapons where you you know you move out of the way and you hit with a sword or something like that. It's exactly that stance. So one, two, and you hit. And again, you use this kind of angled momentum to throw the cross in, so it's just slightly different. One that way, slightly angled momentum. And the other way, one, two, like that. So it's quite an odd movement, but it's really useful for using that 
that front leg is kind of to interfere with the other person's front leg like as a little as a little sweep so you you sweep in the front leg and you go for the go for the cross if you can get that in that's cool that's a cool movement because i'll just fall like that onto the onto the punch i have removed the offending item from my shoe my feyu my sacred feyu wasn't dog poop so you're not in trouble you're never in trouble are you you're never in trouble no you don't not really um no so same we needed the other way move please move please move 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 no not sit i'm going to step step this way towards the dog and you won't be able to see there's going to be one two onto the mate you've got to go over there go 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 one two like that I'm just going to skip into the the root and the hip like that. I'll just practice nice and light and change. See, most of this stuff that you need to learn first of all to get up to the ninety-five percent point, you don't need to be dealing with any power at all. So you can just do loads and loads of practice like this, developing these attributes, developing this footwork. Um, yeah, it's like it's like light exercise. It's not like it's not like you're absolutely slamming these punches out with Farley. You don't want to train like that. It's not sensible. You can massively build all of these attributes just training very light like this. Um, so out, across like that, tippy toe rooting and then skip into the... You know, they're a lot like dance moves though. So like that. It's almost like a Michael Jackson move. One. And back. Easy peasy. When, when we move with the back foot, it's, it's a little bit more difficult and you do have to practice this one a little bit more and a little bit more carefully. You really got to think about your your ankles with this. So we step out like that. Just like it's pointing 45 degrees and it steps out, keeps that 45 degree shape. And then we're just going to step relatively flat, but it's going to come up just a tiny bit on the, on the heel. So one, two, it's going to come up just like we did it before this kind of posture where it comes up on the heel. The back root stays flat, it doesn't follow this rule of using pivot or kickback routing. So it's flat routing one, two, and the front foot is ball of the foot. So and the reason the reason for this is it's, it's in the nature of the posture itself that all my weight is directly on this directly on this leg. It doesn't really make any sense. By by going up on the ball of my foot, I just go off balance. It doesn't, it doesn't root it forward like that in any way. It doesn't add anything to it whatsoever to come up onto the ball of my foot. In fact, it's a negative because I'm off balance. So all my weight is like, instead of being distributed evenly, it's all on the back leg. So I just want it flat on the floor like a column. Because the leg is springy, but nevertheless, just like that. So one, one, two. And the other way, one, two. Again, it times like the timing is foot and the hand hit together. This key principle of Shin and Chan. One, two, one, two. This is what Wang Chun Jai found when you start unfolding all of this stuff. All of that old theory starts to make sense. This is why we say it's gamified. That once you once you reach that level of achievement, then you say, "Ah, oh, right, that makes sense." So you've got ancient Bushu manuals that are kind of written in code that people are like, "What on earth does that mean?" You can never understand it until you can do it and they go, ah, right, they just mean that, like it's... Um, people are pointing all these grand expectations about alchemy and magic powers and stuff like that and you realise it's just some guy trying, how do I get this across? Like knowing that they won't understand it until until they hit that point, like how do I get this across, you know, like... Um, so it could be like... I don't know stand on a column or something like that and you think what does that mean stand ah stand on a column right okay well my weight is like is like that you know stand on a column and strike from below you know um then i think i think that's all the basic ones we need unless i remember another one later um if so i'll introduce it in something else but that's really all the basic steps that you need for your cross that you can then go and then go and practice and you can see straight away that the the the, um, 
the infinite curriculum might start getting quite complicated because if you start thinking like, well, I'm going to need to do that. And then let's say I now want to go forward into a, into a jab, like one, two, one, two. That's a more intermediate level step. So putting these things together takes you onto another level of, of complexity. But you can trust yourself intuitively. Like, are you at that point? Do you want to do you want to try that? Do you want to put them to try it? Of course, and see if you can do it. Maybe you'll be able to do it just straight away. And if you can do it, you can do it. There's no no one's getting a gold star for it taking ten years to do. If you can do it now, just do it. You know, if you can do it, you can do it. So we'll have a think about in another video as we start to put those things together in in more and more complex complex movements, and that's going to become even more complex when we're going to do things like. Well, we'll do lead hand hooks next. We turn the body in a different way. And then, you know, you want to change back into a cross. But then we start learning this other really useful thing that we've already kind of talked about, that you exploit structural movement. Structural movement's designed to be exploited. You're here, and then you're here. <laughs> it's like a machine. Of course a machine's going to go like this. It makes sense in the laws of physics to do this. Just like a machine. A machine but also a giant insect. What is, what is a giant insect if not a machine that's animated by a profound and primitive intent? Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I really do appreciate that people care enough to watch. Spread the word. Um, it's not about money. Just, I mean, there's no paywalls, there's nothing. It's just about promoting Wang Shengjai's vision, trying to get the structural revolution, you know, higher profile. Spread the word. Um, thanks very much. One love. Take it easy.